Good morning. Good to see everybody this beautiful Sunday morning. To begin service this morning, I'll be reading from Philemon chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. It's good to see everybody this morning. If you're visiting, we'd like you to know that you're our honored guest, and we're glad to have you here and like to have you back at any of our appointed times. And right now, brother, our usher, Brother Barry Cook, will come up the center aisle. If you're visiting, ask for a visitor's pack. Fill out the attendance card and pass it to the center aisle, and we'll pick it up during the singing of the third song. It's great to see everyone this morning. Brother Andy Rutherford has our song service. Brother Edward will bring our lesson this morning. I'm going to be reading from Philemon chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Again, it's good to see everybody. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, to the church in, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have, you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. And now we'll go to God in song. Our first song this morning will be 273. For those using the books, of course all our songs this morning will be on the PowerPoint. But 273. <clears throat> Number 251, <clears throat> after this song will be led in our opening prayer, 251.
us pray. Our most gracious and ever-loving Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, as we humble ourselves before Thee in Thy presence, we ask, Heavenly Father, that You would look into each of our hearts. And Heavenly Father, remove from us the guilt of the sin and the sin itself from our souls. Heavenly Father, we realize that we are weak and, and fall so many times, Heavenly Father, to the temptations that are around us. Truly, in this land, we walk in a valley of the shadow of death. Heavenly Father, help us to look unto thee and to thy Son, so that we fear not. Heavenly Father, we have been so blessed. Truly, our cup runneth over, Heavenly Father, the things that you have given to us. And Heavenly Father, help us to realize that all the good and perfect things come from thee. Heavenly Father... Help us to give as you would have us to. There are many people, Heavenly Father, even near and dear to us, that are close to us, that do not have the things that we have. And most assuredly, Heavenly Father, the world over struggles to even have food. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we walk each and every day, we would imitate Christ. Heavenly Father, so often the world does not know Him. And they look unto us, Heavenly Father, and if they do not see Him in our lives, where will they see Him? Help us, Heavenly Father, to do, say, and think the things that you would have us to do. To be obedient servants, Heavenly Father, to you. Heavenly Father, help us to avoid the temptation that besets us round about. Heavenly Father, there are so many things that, that need attention. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would be with those who are sick, physically, Heavenly Father, and spiritually. So many of our number, Heavenly Father, struggle day in and day out with issues that so take their spirit away from them, Heavenly Father, in such a way that we pray that you would heal them, comfort them. The hands that are, that are helping to take care of them, support them, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, there are those of our brothers and sisters the world over who are persecuted for your righteousness that they practice. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would protect them and watch over them. Heavenly Father, we ask thee that you would strengthen all of us in our daily walk. Heavenly Father, we truly need your guidance because it's not within us to direct our own steps. Help us look to your word daily and pray daily, Heavenly Father, that we may be in touch with everything that you would have us to do. There are many things, Heavenly Father, that will happen to us in this own, just in this coming week. Help us to be mindful, Heavenly Father, and watch then we may see opportunities to tell the world of your Son and our Savior. Heavenly Father, there is no way we could live and move and breathe without your grace and mercy that's extended to us through your Son. He so often, Heavenly Father, helps us in our daily walk, watches over us, and Heavenly Father, we pray that we will crucify ourselves, our selfish nature, each and every day and take up the things, Heavenly Father, that you would have us to and follow your Son. Heavenly Father, there are young people that are tempted and, and pushed, Heavenly Father, to, to do evil 
all around us. We pray for them, and especially for our young people. Because we know, Heavenly Father, it's difficult to resist because the world and Satan is everywhere. The evil that encompasses, Heavenly Father, we must realize that it's only in you, in your Son, that we have protection. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with all that are teaching your word, especially those here, Heavenly Father, today. We ask that the, the words that are taught, they be truth from your word. Heavenly Father, help us to realize that your words are the power that allow us to help others. And it's the only power within us that can help save the world. Heavenly Father, we're so lucky to have good leadership here, our elders and our deacons. We ask that you would be with them and strengthen them. Be with Brother Edward and Justin and Barbara and Sarah as they labor here and work with us. Help us to be supportive of each other. And Heavenly Father, our one goal is to live with Thee eternally. Help us to realize that each and every day and walk, Heavenly Father, in such a way that one day we can hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into my rest. Heavenly Father, we ask all these things of thee. We ask, Heavenly Father, you would be with us during the remainder of this service. Guard, guide, and direct us, Heavenly Father, as you would have us to do. And in thy Son's name we ask all this. Amen. For those wishing to mark in your songbooks, our invitation song this morning will be 674. 674. <clears throat> and before the lesson, 274. 274. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. to one and all. I appreciate very much the opportunity to be with you and to be a part of this service this morning. We're delighted you're here and we uh, may have visitors with us. I did not meet any, I don't believe, earlier, but if you're visiting, we want you to know that you are indeed an honored guest and we hope that you will bless us again with your presence at your very earliest opportunity. Some of our ushers uh, will be coming down the aisle, Mike and Barry, and they will have 
the weekly study guides that are available each Sunday for you to use and to take notes and uh, so on in. So if you get a copy from them, you'll have this morning and this evening's basic outline, I think, with most of the scriptures that I'll be using. And I may not always get to all the scriptures that we have, or I may add additional ones to the lesson. I hope that you will read all of those passages and that you will jot down in uh, margins of your Bible or on the study guide itself, those scriptures that we may mention in addition to those that are given therein. I think we're on the, yes, we are ready, and I wasn't ready. Are you ready? That's not the lesson for tonight, this morning. That's the lesson for tonight, fellas. So see if we can get that in. Uh, somebody didn't pick up a study guide and look at it. But uh, we're talking this morning about another subject, and uh, that one, that question, though, is very much important to the lesson that we're studying this morning. I do hope that you will think with us this morning about when Jesus comes. When Jesus comes, what's going to happen? When Jesus comes, am I going to be ready? That's a very personal question that we all need to ask. Just last Lord's Day, Patty Piper walked into the building and she handed me a little piece of paper. And on it was a very, very interesting little thought. That paper read, the weatherman says, a storm is coming and everybody panics. A preacher stands before an audience and says, Jesus is coming, and nobody cares. Sometimes that's the way we preachers, I guess, feel, and that's the reality in many, many instances. I don't think that's true of this audience. And I hope by the time this lesson is concluded, that if you have been of that disposition, you know, what difference does it make? I don't think he's coming. Maybe like some that we read about in the Bible who ask, where is the promise of his coming? For since the beginning of time, things continue as they have always been. Well, that, of course, wasn't true. God had intervened with a great flood. He had intervened with a lot of other things. A lot of other great events are recorded right there in the Bible. So we must never, ever become complacent and indifferent and think, well, Jesus hasn't come by this time, so He isn't coming. Because when we say peace and safety, then cometh sudden destruction, the Bible reminds us. Let us never lapse into a lackadaisical attitude and just say, what's the use of living the Christian life? Think with us about some things. The Old Testament has 1,845 references to the second coming of Christ. Now that's interesting. It has a lot of references to the first coming of Christ. But it also has a lot of references to the second coming of Christ. Now when you come to the New Testament, it consists of 260 chapters from Matthew 1 through Revelation 22. That's 260 chapters. And in those 260 chapters... There are 318 references to the second coming of Christ. That's more than one time per chapter. One out of every 30 verses. Most of us know there are 27 books in the New Testament. 23 of those books have numerous references to the second coming. The three letters that Paul wrote to young preachers, 
The books of 1st, 2nd Timothy, penned to Timothy, of course. The little book of Titus, written to Titus, doesn't say that much about the second coming. But, of course, there are in many of the statements implications of the second coming. And the same is true in the book of Galatians. But 23 out of the 27 books really place an emphasis on the fact that Jesus is coming again. There was a Gallup poll that was taken back during the 80s, 1987 to be exact. And that Gallup poll suggested that 62% of all Americans believed at that time that Christ would return to the earth someday. Now, 62% sounds like a whole lot, but I'm surprised it was not higher than that, and it should have been higher than that. But nevertheless, it was not. In a 2010 Pew Research poll, it was said that 41% of Americans believe Jesus will have returned to earth by 2050. That's roughly 30 years from now. 23% of those people were definite that he will have returned by then. And 18% said that he probably would have returned by then. So there are those that do believe Jesus is going to return. But those are not really very high percentages. And of course, we know from the teachings of the Bible, and if I fail to get to it later in the lesson, Matthew 24 makes it abundantly clear that no one knows the date. Whether it's 2050 or 2075 or 2020, nobody knows. Not even the angels of heaven knew when Jesus said that. Jesus himself did not know whether or not God has revealed it to him since his return to heaven. We don't know. But Jesus even said that he did not know when he would be coming the second time. There have been many great days in the history of the world. Think about how it would have been if you were there for the great flood in Noah's day. We have seen some catastrophic events from the recent hurricane. And we are, you know, just astounded that so many people would lose their lives and so many others would lose their homes and lose basically everything that they owned on this earth. And that sort of boggles our mind to think about all of that. But it should remind us how richly blessed we are this very hour to have all the material things that we have. But those things are so easily taken away and lost. What we need to concentrate on is getting the soul ready for that time when Jesus comes. But I think about so many other biblical events, the fall of great cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, Babylon, Jerusalem, <clears throat> Nineveh, and lots of others that we could talk about. You think about so many of the mass shootings that have occurred. We think about the Civil War. We think about the World Wars. We think about the crash in 29. That wasn't a plane crash. That was the crash of the economy. And the richest men in the world at that time lost everything they had. Many of them committed suicide. There were people jumping off bridges out of upper story windows. I had an uncle who used to tell me stories about seeing people jump off the bridge into the river in Detroit, Michigan. The 19, late 1920s and early 1930s. 
That would be, that's catastrophe. And that's a part of history. But I suggest to you this morning that there is no day, no event that has ever happened that even comes remotely close to the day when Jesus comes again. Not even close. There's no comparison. Because most of those events that I've just enumerated had to do with just really, relatively speaking, small areas of the world. When Jesus comes again, all peoples of all the worlds and all nations will be involved. The Bible says, every eye shall see him, even those who crucified him will see him. That doesn't leave anyone out. All shall be a part of that. I want to point out in the first place, there's some reasons for which Jesus is not coming. And I don't have the time, will not have time this morning to develop all these as much as I would like. But I do ask you to write down the scriptures, take notes on it, take that outline home with you and study it further. Jesus is not going to come again to build his church because he's already built it. He said, upon this rock I will build my church. Matthew 16, 18. Acts chapter 2 says that the Lord added unto the church such as should be saved. He could not have added people to something that did not already exist. So it should be settled upon the basis of just those two scriptures, but there are multiple others that we could mention that emphasize the fact that Jesus established His church just as He promised. We have countless letters addressed to the church at Ephesus, the church at Corinth, and on and on and on. We know the church was built by Jesus. So he's not coming to build his church. He has already done that. Now, what about they say, some say, oh, he's coming to establish his kingdom. Go with me to Mark 9 1 and look at this passage for a moment. You can look up the parallel passages in the other accounts too. But Jesus said to his disciples, There be some of you standing here with me shall not taste death until you have seen the kingdom come with power. How's that again? Picture Jesus standing, talking with a group of his disciples. And he surveys them and he says, There are some of you standing here that are not going to die until you have seen the kingdom. Now that tells us that the kingdom was going to come and be established during the lifetime of those who were listening to it. Now Judas may have been in that group of disciples. He would die before the kingdom was established. But many of those others who were listening to him did not taste death until they saw the kingdom come with power. Remember the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and they received power. They were going to receive power after that the Holy Spirit came upon them. And that event happened in connection with the establishment of the church which is the kingdom. In Matthew 16, go back and read it again you will find that in that context, the term church and the term kingdom are used interchangeably. Upon this rock I will build my church and God will give, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom. So it's evident that they are used to identify the same group of people, but simply describing them from a different standpoint. He's not going to come to reign a thousand years in his kingdom upon this earth. How do we know that? Because John 18, 36 says, my kingdom is not of this world. But I want to go to a passage, and I'm going to turn to this and read it. 
Because as I was preparing for this lesson, as I read this passage, I don't recall ever having thought about this. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, which describes Paul's, uh, uh, gives Paul's statement about, you know, I'm now ready to be offered, time of my departure is at hand, and all of that. Paul said to Timothy in verse 18 of that chapter, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. That's talking about heaven, isn't it? His heavenly kingdom. Now, if Jesus was going to come to build his kingdom and reign upon this earth a thousand years, why would Paul describe it as a heavenly kingdom? It would be an earthly kingdom on this earth. But he describes it as a heavenly kingdom. And he's just been talking about his demise. The fact that he's ready to be offered, time of his departure is at hand. He doesn't say anything about Jesus having an earthly kingdom. He's talking about the heavenly kingdom. I think that's worthy of noting. And I wanted to call that to your attention. Nor is he coming to rapture out the church. Brother Charles White was writing a column. Some of you have heard me tell this before, and I remember that I've told you before. In a newspaper, and he would ask, uh, receive questions from the community, and he would answer them in that newspaper article. And he said, Ed, I wrote the shortest newspaper article I've ever written. I said, really? He said, yes, sir. I had a question what does the Bible say about the rapture? And he said, I had one word in my article that week. The rest of it was blank space. I said, is that right? He said, yep. He said, I put nothing, exclamation point. That was it. Well, I'm sure that he got some other comments and probably some more questions. But that's what the Bible says about the rapture. It's been formulated to fit into a particular religious philosophy. There have been books written about it, movies made about it. I remember reading many years ago that you will probably be watching the Tonight Show one of these nights, and there will be some people that will just disappear off the stage. If they do, they're a part of the raptured out. Did you ever see the bumper sticker? In case of the rapture, this car will be deserted. How many of you ever saw that? I did. I saw one of them. Ken saw it. There may be others that have seen it. But now you don't hear nearly as much about it. It's not nearly the novelty that it used to be. But there's no telling how many millions of dollars have been made because of that particular false doctrine. He's not coming to do that. And another thing that we know, Jesus said, all who live godly, or rather Paul wrote this, but the words of Jesus are included, of course. He said, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall do what? Suffer persecution. Now, if Christians are going to be raptured out. That's not true. If they're going to be raptured out of that great period of tribulation, which is just another word for persecution, they're somewhat synonymous. And go back to the statements of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. Blessed are you when men shall persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. 
It's a blessing to be persecuted. Why? Because it denotes the fact that you are a child of God. If you were a hardened, callous sinner, why would other sinners want to persecute you? But if you're trying to live right and serve God, there will be people who will persecute you and say false things about you. Jesus is not going to come back to die for men's sins. Why? Because He came and died one time for all. Go to Hebrews chapters 9 and 10 and you'll see that. He will come back without sin. Those who have studied the languages and so on of that passage point out that He will not come the second time to die for our sins because He's already done that. He will not come with that burden upon His heart that He is going to have to die for the sins of man because He's already done that. And that sacrifice is sufficient to take care of the sins of all men. Of course, some will not have their sins forgiven because they will never become penitent. They will oppose God. Jesus is not coming to do those things. There's going to be some catastrophic events connected with His return. I want you to look at some of those. As you go to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, you'll find that there will be a shout, a voice, and a trump. Those three things are alluded to in that passage. You will notice that the shout is Christ's shout. And I went back and looked at the original word, and I found it interesting that this word that is translated here Shout means a shout of encouragement. A shout of encouragement coming from the Lord Himself. A shout of triumph, of victory, encouraging His people. Think about that. And then there's going to be the voice of the archangel. How will it sound? I don't know. But it will no doubt be the greatest shout and such voice as we have ever heard or ever shall hear. And then he mentions the trump of God. Perhaps you've heard the story about the preacher who just kept preaching about the trumpet of God is going to sound. A couple of young boys thought how funny it would be to play a trick on him. One of them could play the trumpet. And they sneaked up into the attic of the old church building. And as he was wont to do in just about every sermon, he said, one of these days that trump is going to sound. And that young man played just a note or two on the trumpet rather softly. Preacher said, in fact, I think I hear it now. And he preached a little longer and said it again, and that boy played some notes a little louder this time. And his friend got so tickled that he stepped off the, the, uh, the uh, joist up there and he fell through the ceiling. And the church building was emptied. They thought the Lord had indeed come. There will be no guessing when Jesus comes. I can guarantee you. There will be absolutely no guessing. 1 Corinthians 15 mentions that that trump will be the last trump. It will be the trumpet that will signal the end of all things. Something to think about, isn't it? Then in 2 Peter chapter 3, you'll read about the dissolution of all things. The passing away of the heavens, the melting of the elements, the burning of the earth, and the dissolving of all these things. That's a direct quote. All these things. 
What things? The things of this earth. The fine houses will melt away. The interstate system will just be rolled up and done away with. I remember when I-40 came through and I remember when they were talking about connecting all the major cities with vast interstate systems. It hadn't solved all of our travel woes. But you can sure get from point A to point B a lot quicker than you could many years ago. Even I can recall when it was an all-day trip to go to Nashville and back in the same day. Took you about all day, especially if you did very much at all while you were there. But all that is going to be gone. There's going to be the resurrection of the dead. That's going to occur <coughs> on this last day according to John eleven twenty four. 24. 1 Corinthians 15 describes all of that. The dead are going to be raised incorruptible. Those that are living are going to be changed. And then there's going to follow the great judgment of separation as the shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. Matthew 25, 31 and 32 describes the separation that's going to occur. Uh, we think death is a terrible separation. But friends, that second death is going to be much greater in its impact and effects, isn't it? Raised to be judged. The kingdom is going to be delivered to God. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. The kingdom shall have been delivered up to the Father by Jesus, the head of that kingdom. That's all going to occur when Jesus comes again. When Jesus comes again, I want to suggest to you that it will be unexpected. Why? Because we aren't given the time. No one can predict the date. I saw a, a piece on the internet just the other day that said, Jesus is going to come right here, this year. Not this particular year, but they gave a date. I think before he ended, he said, now this is just really a joke, a make-believe. But there have been countless ones who have predicted the exact year that Jesus was going to come. And of course it never became a reality. From the tests that we see given in the Bible, we know those prophets are false prophets. They say, God has revealed this to me. And then they give that date, set that date, and that date comes and goes. And they still expect people to believe that they're credi uh, credible. Oh no, the Bible says you'll know that they are false prophets. There will be no hiding place. Read those statements from Revelation 6. Don't have the time to read it all this morning, but Revelation 6 verses 12 through 17 there will be those who will be crying out for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them to hide them from that which is about to happen. Can you imagine that? Begging for something like that to occur. Be no hiding place. There used to be an old song that was very popular, no hiding place down here. That's very true. You cannot escape the all-seeing eye of Jehovah. He sees and knows us now. And we will not be able to escape the presence of the Lord any more so than Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. When he called to Adam and said, where are you? He wasn't calling for information so that he might be able to locate him like someone groping in the dark. Behind those words are, Adam, come out. I know where you are, and confess your sin, and ask for my forgiveness. That's the import of that statement. 
God knew exactly what had happened, what he had done. And he was giving Adam a chance to repent. It will be horrific for the unprepared. Read Acts 17, 31. He has appointed a day. What day was, is that? The last day. Wherein he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. You read in Revelation 20 about the great judgment scene. The great throne and all being called before it. To be judged upon the basis of how they have lived. Those who are unprepared will find that a terrible, terrible time. But for those who are prepared, it will be joyful. Enter thou into the joy of your Lord. And then in Psalm 16, 11, the psalmist said, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. What a joyful time it will be. And there's that little book of Habakkuk that has a statement that I don't know if I'd ever really paid that much attention to it or not. Chapter 3, verse 18. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it wonderful to contemplate that? We can all have access to that joy. That pleasure, not all pleasure is bad if you find the things of God to be pleasurable. The pleasures of sin are tragic and will disappoint. But the pleasure of doing God's will will bring you to joyful ends. On a tour of the kingdom... The Prince of Wales dropped in unexpectedly on a commoner and his family. He and his wife were there when, I suppose, a servant knocked on the door and said, The Prince is here. The house was in a mess. The commoner said, I was so dirty. The prince came in, talked with them, visited with them a little while, and then left. And the commoner said to his neighbors, Oh, if I had only known the prince was coming. We know the prince is coming. We know the prince of peace is coming. What did Jesus say in John 14? I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. We know he's coming. He said he was. And the New Testament establishes that fact beyond a shadow of a doubt if you believe God's word. This illustration I will close with. There was a group of people who were in a particular building and they were having the party of their lives. They were drinking, carousing, just having a, quote, wonderful time in their way. The owner of that building came and said, your party is over. It's closing time. What I have been talking to you about this morning is the time when Jesus comes again and says, it's closing time.
Closing time is going to come. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for the judgment day? If not, why don't you make preparation? Become a Christian. Be baptized into Christ as a penitent believer, willing to confess and acknowledge to the whole world your faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son, and then to live that confession every day from henceforth till either you depart the scenes of this life via death or Jesus comes and you hear with your human, human ear, the sound of that shout, the shout, sound of that trumpet, and you see with your physical eye the Lord coming in the air. One more story just came to mind. During the early days of this country, they were having a meeting of the leaders. And it became so dark and ominous that many of our fathers, American fathers, said, let's adjourn this meeting because surely the end is coming. And the gentleman who was presiding said, if Jesus is returning, there is no need for us to adjourn. Because I had rather be found doing my duty than doing anything else. And that is what the word watch conveys in the New Testament. Where it urges us to watch. For you know not the hour. When were all those servants faithful? When they were doing the will of the Master. So how do you prepare? By obeying him to become a Christian and then living faithfully in his service. From that time until you die or Jesus comes again. In either case, you'll be ready. You'll be among those who will be raised to meet him in the air. Or you will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. If you're a nearing child of God, stay no longer in your wayward condition. Come and ask God's forgiveness through His Son, Jesus, the Christ, who died for you. We hope you'll have the courage to come right now, if you're subject, as we stand and as we sing.
a dear sister in Christ.